tonight in a world over exclusive. Former President Donald J. Trump joins me in an exclusive interview from the Al Smith Dinner in New York as voting begins in the United States. And the Synod on Synodality has entered its third week. Why are female deacons becoming the main event? The World Over Synod Central 2024 continues with the papal posse, Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal. And the Israeli prime minister indicates that there might be military reprisals against Iran. And the U.S. says it will withhold arms shipments if Israel holds aid to Gaza. Newsmax contributor and foreign policy expert Dr. Walid Ferez is here with analysis. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. What a show we have for you tonight. If you'd like to comment, send me an X post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo and at Real Raymond Arroyo on Instagram. Lots to cover tonight. Let's get started. Less than three weeks to go till Election Day here in the United States, and the race for president appears to be tightening. There's a new National Catholic Reporter poll showing Trump up among Catholics in five of the seven swing states. Tonight, the former president and current GOP candidate talks with me again about the issues important to people of faith, about life and those multiple assassination attempts. We met at the 79th annual Al Smith Dinner for the Archdiocese of New York, a dinner his opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris, has declined to attend. Here's my exclusive interview with President Donald J. Trump. Mr. President, I'm delighted, first of all, that you made the Downton Abbey auditions. We, I think we're gonna fit in nicely. We're at the Al Smith dinner, of course. Tell me, why did you decide it was important to be here? And what message is Kamala Harris sending by not being here to Catholic voters? Well, I think you're honoring the Catholic Church. And, you know, I've been a longtime supporter. And I'm surprised she's not here. I think she's the first one in many, many, in decades, actually, yeah. to miss it as a candidate. It was uh, always been a tradition. So I'm happy only in that the Catholics are going to vote for Trump now. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, look, I have a special relationship with the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I think it was very important to be here. Yeah. Uh, I've been noticing on your social media posts on your, at your rallies, you're playing the Ave Maria. You're posting Happy Birthday, Mary, a St. Michael prayer to ward off evil. Is that telling voters something about your spiritual journey? What is that? No, I don't think so. It's just beautiful to me. I mean, I, I look at the whole thing, the words and the pictures. The pictures are so beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I put up some stuff. Somebody else asked me that same question. Yeah. And it's really that I think it's really very beautiful. Okay. In 2020, you told me I am a pro-life candidate. Mm -hmm. In the interim, you got rid of Roe v. Wade, and you've said, I've returned it to the states, and people have to follow their heart. Sure. Some of your supporters are saying, well, Trump is pro-choice now. What would you say to them? No, no, uh, I am like Ronald Reagan before me. Um, the uh, exceptions are very important to me, mm -hmm. and that's the life of the mother, rape and incest. Mm -hmm. And uh, not at all. I'm very proud of what we did. Everybody wanted it to be back in the states where it belongs. Mm -hmm. and. The states are voting, and frankly, some of the votes are very liberal by comparison mm -hmm. to what people may have thought. But it's now back in the states. It's an issue that's torn the country apart for 52 mm -hmm. years. And now, uh, and everybody wanted it, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, uh, liberals, everybody, and all legal scholars wanted it back in the states, and now we did that. And I have to tell you, I give great credit to brilliant Supreme Court justices. We had mm -hmm. six yeah. brilliant Supreme Court justices, and uh, they had great courage. And will I you think the country will now come together. Will you reinstate the Mexico City policy, which forbids international spending on abortion. Well, I was the only one that did that, as you know. Yep. No other president did that. And we're going to be giving that a very good, serious look. In other words, how that compares right. and competes with the states. But we'll be giving that a very serious look. The other day you said, I'm the father of IVF. As you know, some Catholics feel, and the Catholic Church believes, when you Im implement this technology, you're killing embryos. Will you have a religious exemption to your 
IVF mandate for religious organizations and businesses that feel this violates my religious principles. Well, you know, I haven't been asked that, but it sounds to me like a pretty good idea, frankly. But uh, even Catholics, a lot of them, they want IVF. It's fertilization, basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they view that as helping a family, helping uh, parents have a child. And it's a very popular thing, but uh, it's certainly if there's a religious uh, problem, I think people should go with that. I should be, I, I really think they should be able to do that, but we'll look at that. Have, Nobody, have a, a, an, an exemption. Question. Well, I got to, look, I got to get some new ones in here. Okay. Kamala Harris is changing her tactic against you. She said to Brett Baer, my colleague, the other night, you, President Trump, are targeting Americans. Uh, you're calling them the enemy within, and you're turning the military on the American people. You and I both know that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree with him. This is a democracy. Your reaction to that, and what did you mean when you said the enemy within? Well, it's ridiculous that she says that they're turning the military. I mean, these are the really... These are the uh, threat to democracy, people like, actually like her with her language. You know, she's the most liberal senator in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, not as smart as most of them, but she's certainly more liberal. And uh, she uh, likes to say that, turning the military, how ridiculous is it? But I will say this, uh, the enemy from within, we do have an enemy from within. We have people that uh, are, I think, more danger to our country. When you see the radical left programs that they're espousing and uh, we have a, a true enemy from within they hate when I say that mm -hmm. but whether we like it and I think in many ways it's more dangerous from the outside em enemies that we have I want to talk about immigration for a moment the church teaches welcome the immigrant it also teaches that a nation has a right to protect its borders for the common good how do you President Trump balance welcoming the immigrant yeah. with locking down the border and the deportation promise you've made. Well, as you know, we had the strongest borders we've ever had just four years ago. We had the most powerful, the strongest. We let people in, but they have to come in legally, and I don't think that's changed. We want people to come into our country, but they have to come in legally. Uh, as you know, they allowed people to come in from prisons and, frankly, murderers, the 13,099 murderers where mm -hmm. they were let out of prison, convicted murderers, and some killed more than one person, some killed more than five people, and they're now free in our country, and we're going to have to get them out, and we're going to get them out fast. Nobody wants that. No, I want to have people come into our country legally, but we have to have strong borders mm -hmm. and good elections. Mm -hmm. Did you see this lip reader when Joe Biden and Barack Obama were on the side of Ethel Kennedy's funeral? This lip reader, who's a forensic expert, claims Joe Biden said, she's not as strong as I am. Was it a mistake to trade Kamala Harris for Joe Biden, in your opinion? Well, we seemed to be winning, and we were way up on Joe. We had the debate, and the numbers were very strong. And I just see numbers that are very similar right now. They're very similar, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. I hope we win because uh, we want to make America great again. Yeah. And, and your record of religious liberty, how important is that to you, religious liberty? Uh, it's a stance that I've taken from the beginning, and I'll keep it. I wouldn't change it for anything. <laughs> okay, final question. The Pope was asked about your candidacy and Kamala Harris, and he instructed Catholic voters to vote for the lesser of two evils. Who do you think he means and why? Well, I think he wants them to vote for me, and I stand for really everything that you stand for and that the church stands for, and she doesn't. She's a, a very different kind of a person. She's a Marxist. Her father was a Marxist and still is a Marxist, mm -hmm. and uh, they are not big into religion, I will tell you. And I'm not just talking about the Catholic religion. I'm talking about any religion. Uh, the whole Democrat Party has gone really radical left, and I'm the opposite. I am totally in favor of religion, and I also like the Catholic Church a lot. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You what a pleasure. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Good. Thank you. My thanks to the Trump campaign and the U.S. Secret Service for their assistance. We have asked Vice President Kamala Harris to join us for an interview as well. We'll keep you posted on that request. <laughs> And it's week three of Synod Central, where we're bringing you the latest from the month-long Synod on Synodality in Rome. Joining me is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, from Rome, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray, joining me in Manhattan. Gents, we're more than halfway through this. Thanks for being here. Uh, I want to start with comments made by Cardinal Gerhard Mueller this week. 
Now, he rejoined the Senate after missing the start of the event due to illness. He renewed his criticism of this gathering, saying it is not a synod of bishops due to the presence of lay voters. He also warned against the creation of what he calls a post-Catholic church. Quote, we cannot follow the example of the ancient Gnostics who wanted to transfer the church to a higher stage of its historical existence and disguise this betrayal with the beautiful label of a synodal church. Father, he also cautioned against the church becoming Christianity without dogma, sacraments, and apostolic magisterium. Your thoughts on those observations? Cardinal Miller is absolutely right. What we're facing here is something unprecedented in the history of the church. Uh, we discussed this a year ago, uh, Raymond, when we were talking about the changes in this composition of the synod. A synod of bishops is precisely that, of bishops. When you bring lay people, priests, deacons, women and men religious, all together, it ceases to be a synod. Now, the Pope has decided that this is what he wants. He wants this kind of meeting. But it is different than the Synod of Bishops as established at the Second Vatican, as it, first of the Second Vatican Council, but then put into effect by Pope Paul VI. So uh, Vatican II called for a meeting of bishops, and now we get a meeting of everybody. So that's wrong. That's not what we need because the bishops are govern the church. They have the sacramental charism of governing the church. Governance, teaching, sacramental ministry, they all go together. This gives the false impression that lay people have an equal say in the governance of the church, and that theory's been going around a lot. In fact, Cardinal Muller is very quite aware of this. People have this notion that if you're baptized, you get to be ruling in the church if you're picked for that. That's not how it works. Those who are chosen yeah. to be the successor of the apostles, they govern the church. Uh, Bob, Cardinal Muller has been making these observations for a good long time, really since last year's synod. Is anyone in Rome listening? Has it changed at all what's happening here? Well, I don't think so. I don't think he's had any effect, whatever. And it's unfortunate that he was ill at the beginning because maybe he could have in, in introduced something early on. What I'm hearing, especially the last few days, is something a little bit different, by the way, that um, Father is exactly right. that they, Not only is, is, is this not a sin, it kind of gives the impression, even though they keep denying it, that this is a democracy. The, the Pope himself says this is not a democracy, it's a consultation. But that's the impression that people take away, and, and often impressions are really the, the message that comes across. What's been talked about explicitly in the last few days in particular is raising up the authority of bishops' conferences and even continental um, you know, uh, organizations of bishops in, in, in many ways. Now, I don't know that this is going to succeed, but I get the impression that this is a way to kind of move off of the, the controversies at the Synod itself and then kind of delegate the further radicalism to uh, very, various bishops' groups. And when I started to see this, I looked up uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was head of the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, actually in the famous Ratzinger report, wrote against bishops' conferences. He says they are not instituted by Christ. Bishops are instituted by Christ. That, there are, that national conferences are nowhere in our tradition. You don't have national conferences. There weren't even nations in many respects when, as the, the bishop's um, uh, role was being developed. Right. So there's, there are two things going on here. On the one hand, we've got this kind of democratic assembly. And on the other, I, I think it's worth keeping a close eye on what's going to happen over the next week and a half or so, because there, there's some reason that they're emphasizing these bishops' conferences, and they're trying to give them a status that maybe won't go as far as the Germans are, have gone in their radicalness, mm. but would portend for the future, we can't really say what. Yeah, well, well Father, it, it, it sounds like the sin at home edition, you know. Cardinal Muller also raised the incompatibility of a Protestant understanding of synodality uh, as opposed to the true concept of synodality in the Catholic sense. He cites Anglicanism as a middle way between Protestant and Catholic understandings and that that's been a failure. Now several non-Catholic delegates spoke at a recent press conference briefing at the Vatican celebrating the new revived ecumenism being fostered by this synod. Father, if the understanding of the synod is flawed, as Cardinal Muller seems to suggest, can true ecumenism be happening at the gathering? And your reaction to what Bob shared about the bishops' conference becoming the, uh, the
the local synod in perpetuity, I guess. Yeah, well, I'll start with that question. Yeah, this absolutely, Cardinal Ratzinger uh, wrote against this uh, decades ago precisely because there was a movement to try and turn national bishops' conferences from the basically organizational structures that they are to organize the apostolate in different countries into sources of doctrinal authority so that a bishops' conference could issue a document on its own authority and teach something new or, or make some precisions, whatever. This is artificial and has nothing to do with Catholic teaching. The only areas in, that bishops use for teaching together is a general council. Uh, and then we have particular councils which have a certain teaching authority, but it, that's a technical question. It's certainly not what the bishops' conference idea that they're putting forward in Rome. It does give that impression. I, let's tie this in with fiducia supplicans. Remember when the African mm -hmm. bishops came forward and said, we're not going to implement it, and the Pope told them you don't have to? This is not right. how the Catholic Church works. But I could see this happening. The Bishops' Conference in Germany says, not only when fiducia supplicans, we're going to extend it to all, pe all people in other ways. You know, we'll have transgender blessings and all this stuff. The Africans won't have it. Chaotic. Uh, now, the, the other questions, of course, there, there's so many different difficult things to talk about in the Synod, because since the Pope organized it, we would have to say, well, the Pope knows what he's doing. But I would say what he's doing is in contradiction to what all of his predecessors did. You do not put bishops in a room and say, we're, we're going to take a vote. And lay people have an equal role to the bishops in advising the Pope on how to govern the church. That's not, it, it's true that what that becomes is a consultation. It's not a synod. A synod is a solemn yeah. meeting in which bishops who exercise authority work together with the Pope. This has become a free-for-all, mm -hmm. and it portends dangerous developments, I'm afraid. Well, Bob, there are plenty of non-Catholic delegates and consultants here as well. Now, I know they were present at Vatican II, but this seems to be a very, this is a do-it-yourself. It almost feels like it's ad hoc and it's being created in real time. Yeah, one of the things that Cardinal Ratzinger said back in the 1980s was um, that these bishops' conferences, and, and they were starting to get to be influential back then, that they tend to dilute the authority of a bishop himself. And the bishop is really designated by the church to be the teacher in a local area. And he gave it as an example what happened under Nazism. He said, you know, the bishops' conference tended to be, have these weak as water statements because they you know they didn't want to anger anybody and they 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 wanted to reach some kind of consensus that everybody could sign off with whereas there were the the real voices that spoke out against nazism and and affirmed the, the catholic teaching about human beings and their their dignity and whatnot with the individual bishops so the danger here is is not only that this is going to be a, a kind of a perpetual synod that is going to be Im implemented via national bishops conferences, but bishops themselves are going to feel somewhat, um, I think, undermined if the focus is on, say, the USCCB rather than what a bishop does in his own uh, diocese. And that, this really changes the, the, the dynamism, and who knows where that would lead. This would really... We don't have, have a. It's like having a constitutional convention to decide. You know how this? How are the states going to uh, interact with the federal government? It's a very complex subject that I think is being dealt with in a very superficial way. Mm. Gents, the subject of a so-called female diaconate and ordination of women seems to continue to jump from the periphery of these study groups where the Pope had relegated them. I think to keep them off stage during this synod to center stage. At the beginning of the Synod, members voted to devote an entire afternoon on October 18th to dialogue with the leaders of these various study groups tasked with discussions of female diaconate, LGBT issues, among other things. They are also taking email submissions until next June from Synod officials and any Catholic who wishes to share their perspectives on these issues. Uh, Bob, what do you expect to see from these dialogues scheduled on Friday? Is this just a getting to know you session or do you see anything real coming from this? Uh, maybe I've gotten too cynical and I have been here a lot of weeks. And let me tell you, the, the, other, the, the other theme I keep hearing from people who are participants is that they are just going up the wall with boredom. Um, you know, there's this link, link uh, this language that gets, keeps getting repeated. I was, 
listening to one of the press conferences uh, just recently, and, and, you know, I've studied several languages. I don't speak German, for example, that well, but I noticed that even in German, it's easy to understand because the German terms are the same terms that they're using in all the other languages. I, I think that this is, it, it's a way of kind of keeping people on side. They, oh, yeah, we're going to be talking about these hard issues of women, deacons, and and LGBT and whatnot, but the Holy Father is actually pronounced against these things already. And so yeah. to me, I think that this is just a way to kind of um, tamp down some of the, the um, more radical elements in the, in the, in the larger group. Um, it may lead to something else. I don't think it will. It, it's typical of, of Pope yeah. Francis that he kind of holds out the, the football and then pulls it away at the, at the, at the last moment. But the, the, uh, this ongoing discussion just kind of keeps giving people the impression that there's almost nothing that might not be redefined further down the road. And in fact, right. one of the theologians at a recent press conference said to somebody who asked him, what are we going to say to people when they don't get an answer? They've asked, you know, LGBT people have, have asked for an answer and they don't get it. And he mm -hmm. says, well, you know, the synod doesn't end at the end of the synod. It'll go on and maybe some point in the yeah. future we'll have an answer. Yeah. No, it goes on and on. Father, it seems they're creating this endless bureaucracy and, and, and formalized discussion over issues that are already settled matters. I mean, there was even a nun at a press conference who was agitating for female ordination. And as we said last week, everyone in the room, all the participants are gagged. They are not allowed to speak except for these few who are chosen, as you underscored in our conversation last week. So who's featuring this? Why is this continually pushed on the international church? Well, I can only guess uh, that this is a strategy that the Holy See has adopted, which is we say no on the one hand, but then we put forward people who will not accept that, and they say, yes, we need female ordination, and they use the platform of the Holy See press conference to say it, and then the Holy mm -hmm. See doesn't issue a correction afterwards saying, well, we already said no to that. Um, this is part of the mysterious way that this pontificate has decided to govern the church, which is that people who say things which contradict Catholic truth are told to occasionally stop it, but in general, they keep doing it and they keep getting invited. You know, the perfect example mm -hmm. we talked about last week, Cardinal Radcliffe, Cardinal-elect Radcliffe, he contradicts Catholic teaching on the on the homosexuality. Yeah, and look, as an example of what we're talking about here, Brazilian Cardinal and Synod member Leonardo Steiner first made headlines on October 12th, again, at a press conference. Uh, he, he said this one in Portugal, then he repeated it at a Vatican press conference, and he announced he's already celebrating a paraliturgical ordination of women, if you will. He said he lays hands on the individual women who is going to, quote, celebrate a sacrament, end quote, like baptism or a wedding. According to Steiner, quote, in our reality, women exercise the deacon's ministries. The vast majority are coordinated by women. The role of women in the church of the Amazon is fundamental. And regarding the laying on of hands, he said, when I send someone, for example, to baptize, I lay hands on them, but I don't lay hands on someone as an ordination. I lay hands as the apostles did, a sign of receiving a ministry and that this person will celebrate a sacrament, end quote. Father, are the duties he's talking about always typical of the role of a deacon? And what impression does this give to the 1.6 million Catholics under his care, not to mention the Catholics watching it around the world? Sure. Well, he's, he's given the impression that he's simulating a sacrament, meaning that he's going through the motions of something that cannot happen. You know, you cannot ordain a woman, a deacon, priest, or bishop. It's impossible. But he goes through the motions of putting her, his hands on her head in view of what she's going to do later at his request, uh, go to a distant area and do uh, baptisms and the like. Well, this is reprehensible. He should not do this. I hope he got up before he did and said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make clear this is not an ordination. Don't, it's not an ordination. <laughs> and then people might say, okay, well, then why are you using the ritual of an ordination, which is the playing on of hands, if it's not an ordination? No, I say, this is a strategy of subversives. You know, they assert that they already are, have the power to do what they want. Stop me. And then he brags about it afterwards. No, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is creating the impression that bishops in the Catholic Church can contradict the doctrine and practice of the universal church and get away with it. I have heard no Roman correction yet on this. Uh, we no. need that. This no. is wrong because people are going to go ahead and do it. Uh, other imitating, 
Well, and some of them are going to say, well, I do believe it's an ordination. Yeah, well, Bob, this is the problem. Look, they're, they're saying, in our experience, as if it, their personal experience somehow trumps the eternal teachings and doctrines of Jesus Christ and his church. I mean, what happens here is the practice becomes the doctrine. From altar girls to this, this guy also supports, by the way, a married priesthood. How dangerous is this freelancing, Bob, and advertising it for the Vatican to allow the advertising of this kind of, let's say it, heresy on an international forum like this? Yeah, I agree with Father entirely. This gives the impression of, of, of a sacrament. And look, we saw it actually with the blessing of gay couples, and let's say it is gay couples, not the individuals in, in these relationships, that immediately start to take on the form almost of a, of a kind of a para uh, marriage uh, 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 sacrament. And, you know, the thing about this in particular is I don't even think that that move, as dangerous that, as it is, is going to satisfy anybody who's a radical. Because it's not the functions that these people want. I mean, you could have some kind of, I don't know, category that's not a, 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 an ordination of women who are doing certain things. And we have, we have religious um, sisters in, in orders and, you know, in all sorts of ways they, they, they serve the church. They don't want the function. They want the power. They want the, they want the status. And that's, that is the thing that has been denied theologically over and over again. I mean, this bishop said he's, we have to recover something that that existed in the past, and it didn't. It's been studied over and over and over again. Yes, of course, there were women in the early church who performed uh, important functions for the early church, but they were not ordained as as uh, ordained deacons are, which is a, a, one of the steps towards toward being a priest. So for him to do to do this, He's confusing things in, in a way that he must know what he's doing and he knows where it might lead to. I, you know, he's the, the he's the Bishop of Manaus, which is in a very interesting place. It's out in the middle of the Amazon, but they also have an opera house because at one point they were so wealthy that they built an, an opera house and, and uh, Caruso sang there one time. And, and a Brazilian friend of mine once told me the alligators could actually hear the uh, opera being sung there. So it's a, it's a strange place. And what he's done is itself a confusing, strange thing that, let, let us hope, is not reproduced elsewhere. Yeah, this Cardinal Steiner also weighed in on fiducia supplicans, which permits the blessing of same-sex couples. Uh, he said this, we bless water, we bless cars, we can't bless a person who's openly homosexual. Father, he goes on to attribute resistance to fiducia to those who want to go back to a pre-Vatican II church that will never return. Your thoughts on this, and I'll throw this in. You also had Timothy Ratcliffe, the soon-to-be cardinal, who suggested the African church's opposition to this was only because of money from evangelicals and the Russian Orthodox. That's what fueled it. Your, your shot. Yeah, I mean, this kind of uh, condescending uh, analysis of the African church by European liberals who basically are saying, uh, no, you know, if it weren't for the money coming from the U.S. and Russia, and if it weren't for the criticisms they get from their Muslim confreres, they'd all be in agreement with us. This is a dream world and ridiculous notion. It's absolutely false. The African bishops believe in the Bible, they believe in the, nor in the moral law, the natural law. Homosexual acts are immoral because they violate the created order and they violate the express commandments of God as read both in the Old and New Testaments. Now, Bishop Steiner, by you know, talking as he does in the way that he does, he, he gives the impression that Catholic doctrine uh, started at Vatican II uh, and that everything else before it is illegitimate. You know, whatever happened to that great movement that we have to get back to the life in the early church to interpret, you know, how things should go in the life of the church? Uh, we should go back to the early church, read the scriptures, read the fathers of the church. There are no women deacons. There are no homosexual couples being blessed. Uh, we're basically, we're in a willful situation where men with power betray their oath as bishops and undermine the faith. They're supposed to defend the faith, not dismantle it. Uh, gentlemen, Pope Francis received, and again, this is the only thing we're, we're really allowed to cover, and I'll just share this with you as a journalist, and Bob, you can reflect on this in a second. We don't have access to the room itself, this synod, this great listening moment for the whole church, 
The only people allowed to listen to it are the invited participants, those hand-selected by the Pope and those around him. We only get press conferences and the occasional uh, shots of private meetings that are happening on the edge of this. Now that takes us to this story. The Pope met with another group of trans persons for a nine-minute meeting on October 12th. The meeting was organized by Sister Janine Gramick. She's the founder of New Ways Ministries, and just for context, Cardinal Ratzinger, back in 1999, prohibited Gramick from working with gay people because of, quote, errors and ambiguities in her approach. Following the meeting, Sister Janine said Pope Francis was willing to, quote, listen to the experiences of intersex and transgender people. She went on to say that she thinks these stories will help the church, quote, break out of old, ill-informed teachings and practices, end quote. Bob, there apparently was a surgeon present at this meeting with the Pope who advocated sex change operations for those who are intersex and trans. What message do this, does this send? And why would the Pope meet so freely with these individuals and not others in the church? That, that surgeon actually has done uh, sex, uh, uh, sex change surgeries. So he's, he's one of the butchers that, that we, uh, we, we read about. Look, there's, you know, among the many contradictions and, and confusions that we t we've talked about over now years, consider this. The uh, New Ways Ministry is very radical. It's, it's even more radical than Father James Martin because they're, they're open about what they want. I think Father Martin kind of plays the, the, the margins. And New Ways Ministries was condemned by our bishops' conference. So if on the one hand you're trying to affirm the fact that bishops' conferences should have some kind of authority over a certain territory, and then on the other hand you have an, an instance in which the bishops, who know that country extremely well, much better than anybody in the Vatican is going to know it, have rejected what these people have been doing for decades, what does that tell you? It, it tells you that the people who are, are doing these things are making it up as it goes along. And I, and I think that the one thing that, that is so utterly striking is the Holy Father meets with these people right in the midst of the synod, which took that issue off the table. So is he sending out a message to them? You know, I, I'm sure he thinks yeah. he's, he, I may have said this before on the show, but I, I, I think it bears repeating. I'm sure he thinks he's meeting with the tax collectors and prostitutes. But he sits there and he smiles, and then they came out, and not only did they say that it, it made a difference, they seem to have the impression that he had said that he would be open to appointing bishops who were more welcoming of LGBT. Very confused, multiple messages that, that I think are only going to continue to do harm because not only are they bad in themselves, but they contradict one another. Father, that, that surgeon that Bob and I mentioned a moment ago, he described Francis as very, or she described Francis as very receptive to her message and the message of the group. Which brings me to this, New Ways Ministry is really controlling the message here. They're doing the teaching. While the Vatican offers no clarification, no correction, no official release on what happened there, and the gags of the actual bishops at the meeting continue. Your reaction? Yeah, this is so disappointing to say the least. It's really infuriating that a woman, this nun, who criticizes Catholic teaching as being outmoded and outdated, is given the privilege of seeing the Pope. This isn't the first time. She also got a congratulatory letter from the Pope. She is an enemy of the Catholic faith. We have to say it quite clearly. She was corrected decades ago. She refuses to take the correction. Receiving her gives the impression that it's okay to deny the faith because you have access to the Pope and then you can leave a meeting, characterize the meeting, and then not be contradicted. Uh, this is really terrible. It's not good for her soul, the souls of the people that she's influencing. And really, what did the Catholic faithful look to the Holy See for? Confirm the brethren in the faith. How do you confirm brethren in the faith when you take people who are radical deniers, not only of revelation and the natural law, but of the very human existence made by God? God created us male and female. These people say, no, that's up to you to decide. This is terrible. It really is bad. And I can't help but say, as we've said over the years, when a group of Latin mass Catholics get similar courtesy and are allowed to spend time with the Pope and tell of their anguish and then walk out and say the Pope is on our side, then I'll be say, well, at least there's some fairness in who gets to see the Pope. Mm. Gents, last week we reported on the announcement of that December consistory that will elevate 21 new cardinals into the College of Cardinals. 
This week, Vaticanista Louis Badia, a Chilean journalist, had some interesting observations about the statement that I want to get your reactions to. Specifically, he asked how much synodality goes into the selection of these new cardinals. The notion of internationalization and peripheries, which the Vatican mentions regarding the church of the 21 new red hats, is, quote, vague and arbitrary. He says, and many of these men preside over minuscule Catholic populations in their dioceses. Father, uh, Badia also says the 163 cardinals created so far by Francis seem to be carbon copies of him, at least in their thinking. How is that synodality? Well, there's no synodality, obviously, on this because the Pope, unless it's all private and we don't know about it, uh, he doesn't consult uh, widely, you know, with totos, with everybody about who should become a cardinal. In fact, he announced his criteria years ago that he wanted to take people from the peripheries, which undermines the historical institution of the College of Cardinals. The College of Cardinals originally was meant just for Roman clergy, then it expanded to major dioceses and important uh, places uh, in the Catholic world so as, so as to gain the knowledge, wisdom, and experience of the bishops of large flocks. Now, for instance, the Bishop of Tehran, you know, I have more people in my parish than he has Catholics in the entire country. Uh, why is he being chosen to be a cardinal? No one knows him. I, I hope, and sh I'm, you know, I'll say this, I, God bless him, and I'm not criticizing him. He didn't make this choice. But why is it the, mm -hmm. the Archbishop of Los Angeles uh, is not a cardinal, whereas the Bishop of Algiers and the Bishop of Tehran is, this makes no sense. And then the Pope nominated his, uh, the priest who does his travel arrangements and made him a cardinal, he's a priest from India. No criticism of him, but that's not how the system's supposed to work. This isn't a prize to be given to people who have access to your office and get to talk to you on a frequent basis. This should be reflecting the universality of the church, and that's missing here. Yeah, Badia calls them, the, the Chilean journalist, he calls them copy-paste cardinals, Bob. Can there be dialogue when everyone agrees in lockstep or at least has the same mindset? I'll give you the last word quickly. Yeah, I don't think that that's actually quite right. For example, the Ukrainian Catholic um, bishop who was, uh, it will be raised to be a, a cardinal, I've heard privately that when the the Australian bishops met with the Pope, he was the most outspoken in criticizing the way that the the, uh, the, the Pope has been handling uh, abuse cases and some other issues as well. But somehow he took a shine to this younger guy. He passed by Anthony Fisher, the, the Archbishop of Sydney, who's a terrific guy. Um, and he, of course, uh, Shevchuk the, uh, the, in uh, Ukraine has not been, been made a cardinal. So um, there, there is a little static in this, and I think it has something to do with the chaotic way that we remember a few years ago, the Pope decided that the, some bishop in Mongolia was going to become a cardinal, and then there's a, yeah. a bishop in Tonga that became a cardinal. It, it isn't right. that kind of prudent, uh, kind of um, calm weighing of what you know. What what are we doing here? There's just kind of a, you know, this, the, he gets enthusiastic about somebody. I think Badia is about right for about half of the people. The other half we'll have to see. Okay. Gentlemen, we will leave it there. Thank you both for commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray. Visit thecatholicthing.org and tune in October 24th for our next Synod Central update. Thank you, gents. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu indicated that reprisals against Iran could be imminent. The U.S. threatens to halt arms shipments to Israel, and the Israelis continue their incursion into Lebanon all just weeks before the U.S. presidential election. Will Israel limit potential strikes against Iran to only military targets? For answers, we go to foreign policy expert and author of Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy, Dr. Walid Fares. Walid, thank you for being here. On Tuesday, the U.S. wrote to Israel's government giving it 30 days to urgently boost humanitarian aid access in Gaza or face having some U.S. military arms assistance cut off. The letter which calls on Israel to end the isolation of northern Gaza is the strongest known warning from the Biden administration to Israel. And on Wednesday, Prime Minister Netanyahu told President Biden in their first phone call in months that Israel would target Iran's military infrastructure, not its nuclear or petroleum sites. This in retaliation for the missile strikes launched in Israel earlier this month by Iran. 
Uh, Walid, what do you think the Israeli reaction will be like, and how will Israel respond to this pressure by the U.S.? Well, this pressure, Raymond, is not new. This is part of the old Obama administration pressures on Israel and then renewed in 2021 by the Biden administration, but renewed again after October the 7th. The bottom line, Raymond, is that this pressure is connected directly to the Iran deal. Uh, we all know you and I have discussed many times that money has been sent, $150 billion. Some money may have came back and funded some of the Iran lobby, Iran Islamic regime lobby, and that is the reason why there is this uh, inexplicable pressure on Israel to, you know, allow Hamas to survive, because that's what it is about. Uh, Israel is allowing human uh, human resources to go to the Gaza. What that ceasefire is about is to stop, allow Hamas to survive, and then maybe invite them to some table of negotiation. It's a no-go for the Israelis, and even for the Arabs, who also are against Hamas. But when it comes to Iran, and the attacks, potential attacks by uh, by Israel on the regime, I think that the idea of targeting only the military and only that nerve center of the regime will allow this. It will allow the Iranian people to rise, and that's that's really how we're going to end that war, not just by military means. Walid, the Israelis have proved rather creative in their tactical responses to Hamas and these other terrorist organizations. Uh, what do you expect? to see coming from Israel and when? Military to military, Israel has a technological edge. We've seen this. I mean, we've seen things we haven't even thought about, like the uh, uh, the war waged by Israel in, in, in reaction to Hezbollah, constant bombardment of Israel, including the pager issue, the Tokiwoki issue, and of course, the way they target a very, very, like a, in a surgery, uh, the leadership of Hezbollah and their depots, not just in southern suburb and other controlled areas by Hezbollah, but across Lebanon. So this is huge tactical victories and advantage by the Israelis. But at the end of the day, should it be in Lebanon mm. or in Iran, at the end of the process of an Israeli you know, victory over the technology of these two rogue forces, you need to have the people with you. Lebanon has 70% of its population against Hezbollah. They showed us, you and I discussed it, all these demonstrations, mm -hmm. the Cedars Revolution. This is where the United States should be focusing on. Instead of putting pressure on Israel, they should be putting pressure on Hezbollah, on the Islamic regime in Iran, and let the society decide for the future of these countries. Uh, on Tuesday, Israeli government spokesman David Menser spoke about the terminal high-altitude area defense system, the THAAD, defense system. That's an American anti-ballistic missile defense. And uh, in fact, we have the sound. We'll play some of this for you. Israel has never asked for American boots on the ground. Uh, these um, U.S. personnel will be operating the THAAD um, missile defense system, which is able to uh, shoot out of uh, the sky from very high altitudes. Uh, these Iranian um, uh, missiles, which Iran is threatening us with, Waleed, do you anticipate involvement from U.S. troops in the region or troops from other countries to support Israel against Iran? And can Israel continue to go it alone? Obviously, United States personnel is going to be needed to operate this THAAD system. All depend on who is going to be with whom. If Israel and the U.S. are and will be, probably uh, with the next administration, completely integrated in their response, to the Islamic regime, Hezbollah, Hamas, and others, then that would be the maximum. They could work with freedom together, uh, counterattack or defense, that's up to them. We're not there yet. Current administration, mm. going by the books of the partnership between the United States and Israel, are installing all these uh, anti-aircraft, anti-missile like the Thad and others in Israel, only if Israel is attacked by the regime. Only if Israel is attacked by the regime. So that's something it's a it's actually a protection above the Israeli protection. But if Israel goes outside Israeli airspace or territory into Hezbollah, into Iran itself to engage with the Islamic regime, or in Syria or in Yemen, this is an area that the United States under this administration is not going to help Israel. Israel knows it, but what it would be concerning to us is the fact that even that defensive measure could be could be abolished, stopped by a, you know, Harris administration if, if, if she's the one to win the elections. And that's what would be very concerning for Israel and the Arab moderates. For now, 
the U.S. is doing as much as it can within the partnership with Israel in the defensive mode, not in the offensive mode. We saw last Sunday the deadly attack by Hezbollah against an army base deep inside Israeli territory. Four soldiers were killed, more than 60 others injured, eight of them seriously, uh, bringing the total of Israeli Defense Forces soldiers killed since the start of the ground operation two weeks ago to at least 18. While Israel is still fighting Hamas in Palestine while engaging Hezbollah in Lebanon, can they mount a full-blown attack on Iran at the same time, three theaters at once? Actually, they can. We saw what they've done throughout history, right, during the Six-Day War. They were fighting the Egyptians in the Sinai, and the Egyptians were at the time on the offensive. Uh, the Syrians uh, from Damascus on the Golan Heights, and they were still fighting the PLO. At that time, of course, the Jordanian forces, they could do three. They did it in 1973 as well, and they were in a very difficult posture. Yes, they can, but it's very costly. So that's why factor time is important for the Israelis. That's why they're taking their time with Hezbollah, diminishing their capabilities. Yes, you mentioned in your intro that Hezbollah is targeting bases in, in Israel, but if you compare the losses on both sides, Hezbollah is headless today. But at the end of the day, I keep saying uh, uh, that Israel can do as much as it can if it has the United States with her and other allies, including Arab allies. There is, there is no mm -hmm. doubt about it that they will defeat the regime in Iran and Hezbollah and the other militias. Israeli President uh, Isaac Herzog visited the northern cities of Haifa in Kiryak Bialik on Tuesday. He warned Lebanon that it is paying the price for the actions of Hezbollah. At least 21 people have been killed and eight others injured in an Israeli airstrike in northern Lebanon, according to Lebanese health ministry. Uh, the strike hit a residential building in a predominantly Christian village, Waleed. Describe for our viewers the situation in Lebanon and what is the state of the Christian community there, if you know. That's an excellent question. We're going to allow me to explain many things, but in very uh, uh, short timing. So number one, when we say, when the Israeli speaks about Lebanon, they don't mean actually the country of Lebanon, which has like Christians and Sunni and Druze and Shia. They are specifically talking about Hezbollah-controlled regime or government in Lebanon. And we see it in the media, widespread. Lebanon has been attacked. Lebanon is responding. It's not Lebanon. The government in Lebanon is controlled by Hezbollah. It's like France under in, in World War II under Nazi occupation. You know, the, we wouldn't say France, it was German occupation or Nazi occupation. So that's what's happening in Lebanon. Now, the incidence of actually Israelis striking inside the Christian area, which is of concern to the Christian world, and it's not mm -hmm. against Christian cities and villages, it's against Hezbollah cells have occupied those areas. So the population in those areas are occupied or are oppressed or suppressed or infiltrated by Hezbollah. And what Israel is targeting within Christian areas, within Druze areas or Sunni areas, are not these communities. These are occupied. They're, they're, they're basically concentrating on Hezbollah presence in those places. Walid, the Biden-Harris administration has given Iran, as you mentioned earlier, billions of dollars, including as part of that prisoner swap uh, earlier this year. And is the U.S. in effect financing this attack on Israel? Your thoughts on what the next U.S. president also might have to unravel, no matter yeah, who I takes tweeted, the White House. Sorry, I tweeted on this. Yes, indeed. Us, or this administration, transferring money to the regime, the Khomeini's regime, billions of dollars. Where do you think those billions of dollars are going? To reform uh, the economy of Iran, the education of Iran, to move the, the country towards peace and, and Abraham Accord? Like, no. They have been funding, first of all, these militias. So the weapons that was, mm -hmm. you know, bought by the Iranians, produced by the Iranians, was financed by the money that we sent them. So I even argue that the attack by Hamas against Israel on October 7 got its money from the money we released to the regime, which is something crazy, I would say, because that same money, that same organization is connected to jihadists who are targeting U.S. personnel in Iraq, in Syria, and eventually, mm -hmm. through our southern borders, it's coming back to bite us, to kill us. Waleed, you recently attended the National Union for Democracy in Iran, a conference in D.C., where you called for a full overhaul of U.S. policy toward Iran. Briefly, what should that policy be? 
absolutely when we're going to have another administration. There are very specific things that the next administration need to do, even faster than in the first administration. Because if you have a Harris administration, it's going to be worse and worse. The Obama-Biden line, and we don't know where it's going to go, maybe partnering with the Islamic regime. What the next administration needs to do, number one, is to address from the Oval Office the people of Iran. We have to speak with them because once a U.S. president address a nation of 80 million people, he's going to have the biggest ally in the region, the Iranian people. Number two, he will have to receive the Iranian opposition. Most of the heavy lifting in Iran will be done by its people, not by us. Three, we need to read it. We need to stop sending the billions of dollars to this regime. This is another. This is another danger to us to our national security. And obviously, we need to recreate that coalition that the Trump administration had uh, formed in, nine, in 20, uh, 2019 out of Warsaw. There was a Warsaw alliance, all these countries isolating the regime. There is a, you know, hundreds of points that the next uh, administration can do, but we need to have a decision. We need to have a next administration. Waleed, we will leave it there. Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy is available now in bookstores and online. And you can catch the War and Freedom podcast with Waleed Faraz and Gazelle Shamad on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Waleed. Thank you. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to tune in next week. We'll have panel reaction to my interview with Donald J. Trump and our next update from the Senate. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now. Thank you.